you know, in Africa, the first thing you do is to say, well, how are things? So how are you? <laughs> it's a joy to be here and uh, a real privilege to, to be in such a fellowship of leaders gathered together to hear the Lord and seek after the presence of the Lord. A joy also to be among many friends meeting again. And I want to say thank you for, to the leadership of the Messenger Fellowship just for this time for Sheila and I to be here. Sheila, will you just stand and wave to them? <laughs> That's my bride. We are so thankful to God for the time that we've been together with Sheila. Not only uh, Sheila and I, but also our children. The Lord has been so gracious. He's been hovering over us as a family since we got married earlier this year. And it's, a, it's been a joy traveling around with Sheila. I've been traveling for four years as a lone traveler. <laughs> but I thank God for the change. And <laughs> um, I've been praying and waiting upon the Lord this afternoon just about this very time we are having right now and thinking how important it is and even the, the theme, the church at Crossroads. And I must confess right now that, I don't know, when things are about to happen, I tend to come to a point where my heart gets burdened with sometimes maybe it may appear like it's negative but it's like a way of looking at the other side okay we are pushing this side but what about the other side and i was thinking this afternoon how many times people come before god like it is said in the book of ezekiel they come and say we want to hear what is the lord saying what is the lord saying to us and then the, the Lord said to Ezekiel, they come to you and they listen as if they're listening to a beautiful song. Then they go away and they don't do anything about it. And I'm, I'm, I was just praying this afternoon and thought, oh Lord, how many times do leaders come, intercessors come and say, Lord, what is it you're saying? We just want to know your heart. And yet when God speaks, we go and say, oh, that was, that was God. And that's all. I don't do much about it, especially if the Lord would speak to us when we are at crossroads. When you are really at crossroads and you want a, a way forward, and someone says, that is the right way, you don't say, oh, sure, that is so helpful. And then you stay where you are or you choose to go another way. Definitely you begin to move in the direction that the Lord has, that, that you have been given. And... Um, it's important, I think, even at the very, very beginning, as we begin this journey, to say to the Lord, help me that I may not be ju here just to listen and hear, but I am here to be sensitive to your marching orders. I'm here not just to, to hear what, how wonderful things may be or even how accurate they may be prophetically, but I just want to say, Lord, if you show me clearly the way to go, I promise you, I will start on that way. And that may come in many, many different ways. It could even come during the time of worship and praise because that's a time the Lord really ministers to us in different ways. Why don't we take a moment and just pray over that? that over the, last, the next few days, we are not just hearers, not even just appreciators, but we are here to say, Lord, speak and your servant will obey you. Let's take a moment and just pray for that. Every one of us in your own words, just talk to God for your own personal life and your ministry and charge. Jesus, we give you praise. We give you glory and honor. Lord, we know that we've all come a long way in our spiritual walk and ministry to you. We've all met the valleys and the mountains. We've come up against walls and we've come up against the constraints of our system. And Father, many times we've felt like we want to settle for what we see today rather than what we know is offered to us in the scriptures. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that through every kind of ministry that is going to be here in the next few days, 
that somehow you'll get through to every one of your people, every one of your servants, everyone according to, your resp to the responsibilities you've called them to. That's, Lord, somehow you'll speak into our hearts the direction for the next the next era, oh God, that we don't leave this place, oh God, as we came, but we leave having heard you, having met with you, having conferred with you, oh God. And Lord, we pray for the grace, the grace to receive and to apply, to walk the walk, Lord. And in all things we say, all we desire is your glory and let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll ask you to go with me to the book of Psalms. <clears throat> Psalms 11, verse 3. And it says, When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's a wonderful question to ask ourselves. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And there are many, many ways we could approach this particular scripture. But before I go into any sharing, I want to just share my very first encounter with God on this continent, on, this, on the soil of America. It was about eight years ago when I first came to America. The Lord had spoken to me earlier to prepare myself for what he was going to send me to, to Israel and to Europe. And I spent many weeks, many, actually months, praying with the intercessors in Uganda, spending many hours just interceding for these two lands. But just a month before I came, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, work on getting an American visa because I'm going to send you to America on this very trip. And I'll not go into all the details, but at the time I found myself in America, and I was in Chicago, and I came... I registered for a conference that was in Chicago to do this prayer and spiritual warfare. And then I was to visit some friends who had come down to Uganda, who were in Oklahoma. And I didn't know why God was sending me to America. He had given me a very clear prophetic word for, for Europe and for Israel. And had promised me that on, this, on that particular trip, every nation where he's going to take me is going to be, give me a word for that nation. So I asked the Lord about the word for America, and he simply said, I'll give it to you on the road. And I accepted that. And one, about a few days, maybe about three, four days before I left UK to come here, I was praying in the, in the, before dawn, and I received two, the two chapters of Genesis 18 and 19. And I, I felt the Lord was leading me to read through them. And I did that. And after reading through them, the Spirit of the Lord just said to me, intercede through those verses for America. And that's the, the you remember when the angels came to visit Abraham and ate with him, and then they talked about Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham stood before God and interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the next chapter, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I came to Chicago. And the very first night I got here, I went straight to the conference, which was a blessing. I came back and got on my knees to pray before going to bed. And I did everything I knew how to do, but I didn't break through into God's presence. And I went to bed. The next morning, I woke up and got into prayer. And I prayed and prayed, but did not break into the presence of the Lord. And I thought, that's odd. I went to the conference. In the evening, we prayed together. I was staying I was staying in the same room with a, a Kenyan pastor. And we prayed together. Again, I didn't feel that I broke through into the presence of God. And for me, that was a cause for alarm. Because I had not spent that long without breaking into his presence for many, many years. And I thought, Lord, something must be very wrong. And very early in the morning when I woke up, I said, Lord, I'm not going to the conference. I'm going to stay here. And deal with whatever is the issue with my life. Maybe I opened up to the enemy somehow and I feel I'm closed out. So the next morning I just stayed the whole morning before God. At around 11, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, it's not about you. It's about the land. It's the land where you are. And said, there are layers and layers and layers of darkness 
covering this land. And this darkness is like a veil separating my people from my presence and hindering their prayers and quenching the spirit of prayer in my people, quenching faith in my people, quenching zeal, and just low, putting them as low as it can push them. And it says, this is the, the, the kind of suffocating environment the church was operating in. That gave me more burden. I, I, I stayed the whole day just praying and interceding. And I got all, all sorts of uh, things in my spirit. But when I left Chicago and went to Oklahoma, my burden increased because I came to the fellowship of my friends, their pastor friends, and they had been such a blessing to us, a big, big, big blessing to us in Uganda, both prophetically and also in ministry. God used them powerfully. And yet coming to their fellowship, there was such a hold over the, the fellowship. You felt you could not operate in any way. Any effort really to pray down the presence of God, and it just was in vain. And that led me even further into prayer. I remember when I went back, the first thing everybody told me is, haven't you been eating? Because I went back much lighter than, than when I came in. Because for many days I just couldn't eat. And one day when I was praying, I saw a vision before me. And in this vision, I saw a pillar. It was a white, a pillar made of white clay. And it was like china clay. And around it were flowers of the blue flowers molded into the pillar. It was about one meter high. It was just before me. And on top of the pillar, about this size, was a plate, brown plate. And on top of the plate was a beautiful, beautiful cake, white and round and with a lot of decorations. And I marveled at the beauty. But as I looked at it, it, it started moving away from me. And the further it went, the bigger it became. Until the pillar turned into a very high hill and the cake turned into a city on top of the hill. And then out of the city came light and sent a big glow in the sky. It was, it was so beautiful, so beautiful. And as I marveled and looked on, I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, that is the destiny of this land. To be a city set on a hill, a light in the darkness, and a messenger of my word. And then I saw the, the picture come back. And as it came back, it reduced back into size. And was again a pillar, a plate, and a cake. But this time the pillar had cracks. And I can't explain why, but panic gripped me. And I felt, oh my God, it's going to break. And as I spoke it, the voice spoke behind me again and said, I'm looking for a man who will stand before me on behalf of this land. But I found none. And then the cracks really became big and I could see darkness inside the, the pillar. And I, I began to scream. It's going to break. It's going to break. It's like I thought somebody should come and hold it. And as I screamed, the pillar broke. And when it broke, the plate fell and broke into two pieces. One piece fell this way, the other piece fell that way. And the cake just fell in the middle and just broke into very, very, very small pieces. The light, which was in the city, which are still around the cake, stayed in the air for a moment. It was there as a big glow, and then it went on dying and dying and dying away until everything was darkness. And when the vision disappeared, I found my whole body was trembling, tears were flowing over my, I mean, tears were flowing, and I was really weeping. And I began to pray like a little baby weeping. And I said, Lord, what is the meaning of this? The Spirit of the Lord said to me, the foundations of this nation are being broken one after another. One after another, every foundation is being broken. And I'm looking for a man who will stand before me on behalf of this land that I may not destroy it. That I may not give back to it as it has walked before me. And I cried and said, but Lord, America 
is a land full of so many big ministries. Ministries with big names and people who are reaching out to the rest of the world and coordinating prayer and prayer of this sort and prayer of that sort and bringing the nations in coordination. How can you say, Lord, that there's no prayer, not enough prayer here? And the Lord said to me, the cry of sin in the land is louder than the cry of prayer. And a few other details that went with it. I felt sick after that. The following day, I couldn't go out of my room. I just stayed in for a few days. And as I continued to pray, one day I was really pleading and pleading and pleading and said, Lord, this is not the last word you have for America. I want to hear your heart for America. And then one time I was, I was praying. And in the middle of my prayers, I was pleading like this. The Lord began to speak to me and said, the cloud of judgment is hanging over this land. And three waves of judgment are going to hit this land. One will be a judgment against the spirit of Mammon. It says, because my people have made money a god in my place. And I've turned everything to rotate around money and have replaced me with, my, with the spirit of Mammon. It says, I'm going to hit at their financial foundations and everything will come tumbling down. It will not only touch this land of America, it will pull down the economies of many, many other countries. They'll come tumbling. It says, when you speak, speak out to my people. Not only here, but everywhere you go. Turn your eyes away from the perishables and fix them on the, that which is everlasting. It says, tell my people to fix their faith in me. When things fall apart, they will stay standing. It says a second wave will come and hit this land to be a judgment against human pride in human achievements. What man has built, what man has done, what man has, has been able to put together. And, think, and because of that, he thinks he can be God. He can replace God in his lifestyle and he can choose what is good for him and what is bad for him. And he can do, set his own standards. And says, the judgment upon that is going to come in natural calamities. It is going to come by natural means. It will hit at the civilization of man. And again and again will hit. And the time will come when it will get so intense, whole cities will be razed to the ground in a matter of days. So the third one is a judgment against the liberties that overthrow my statutes and standards. In the name of rights and freedoms, my people have rejected my standards. And I've chosen to, to state, to institute their own standards for themselves. It says, at this moment, my hand is holding back the, the consequences of their choices. But the day is coming when I will lift my hand and allow the flood of the consequences of the choices they've made to come fully flooding over the land. And at that time, there will be a cry for help, but help will not be near. And that was that. And again I was crying, Lord, is this your heart for America? I know you've got something that is redemptive for this land. Everything I'd heard since I'd come in was negative, negative, negative. The next day I was supposed to speak in a church in Oklahoma, in Tulsa. And I went, and I didn't have anything else to say but to share the experiences I'd been going through in the past few days. And the presence of the Lord was so heavy. And as I spoke, there was such vivid uh, detail coming out. And in the, at a certain point, everybody just broke down and they began crying and the crying eventually rose into wailing and I couldn't go on. I had to stop. And we all went down on our faces and cried and cried and cried. And the crying was getting more worked up. And I thought, Lord, let this be true brokenness. Let this pull the people through. And immediately the Lord spoke to me. He says, it's not in brokenness that they are crying. It's in anger. How can God be so unjust to do that to us? How can a God, a loving God, do such a thing to us? It's in anger, it's in unbelief, and it's in total rejection. 
And that broke me. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to pray about that. When I went back to my room that night, we actually got a misunderstanding with my hosts because they wanted me to eat. I'd been, I hadn't been eating for some days, and I just didn't have the heart to eat. And I had a little argument. But I went back to the room, sat down on the floor. It was a bit cold. I mean, it wasn't cold, but I just felt I was so lonely. I put a blanket around me, and I sat with my legs curled up and began to just weep. And I said, Lord, I just ask one thing. I want to know what's your heart. What's the last word you have for America? And it took a long time. It didn't come immediately. But with time, he said, pray that the remnant will be big and strong and that they will not fear to stand and they will have the faith to claim this nation back. My purpose is for this nation are yet unfulfilled. I'm not through with this land, but I want people who will stand before me on behalf of this land. And for me, that was like, like, like gold. For me, that was, if, I don't know, sometimes they say Ugandans or Africans have got simple faith. God speaks one word and you feel, okay, that, I'll go with that. And you're willing to change your entire lifestyle, you change your work schedule, you give up things just on that one word. For me, that was enough. If I was an American, that was going to be the hinge of my life. I spoke it out with zeal. I told, listen, this is what the Lord says. We should pray that the remnant shall be big and strong and have the faith to claim back this land and not, be, and not let it go down. But I didn't seem to see the same enthusiasm. And I must confess, when I went back, a number of people sent invitations immediately. Will you come back? We'll do this and do this. We'll organize this. I just felt I didn't want to go through the experience again. And it took me three years before I could say yes again to come to America. And today, I want just to pose a question. And this is not a question about what I've said. It's a question about you. As people God has planted in this land and entrusted with the heritage of this land, when God says the foundations are being broken, when the foundations are being broken, what should the righteous do? And I pray that somehow God will wake us up to say, I don't just want another good program. I just don't, don't I just, I'm not just looking for another discipline. I want to stop in my footsteps and say, hey, the foundations left and right are breaking. Everything around me is falling apart. In every area of life, what am I expected to do by my Lord? And if only I can see clearly what the Lord wants me to do, am I willing to say yes, Lord? Because saying yes is going to mean dramatic change. And that's one thing I've found many people are not willing to face. Many people want something that comes in gradually just to fit in with But imagine those men that met Christ 2,000 years ago. How dramatic was the change that came in their lives. Oh, imagine the gospel coming down to Africa 100 years ago. Or even now as it is going on. I had the privilege a few years ago, just about 15 years ago, to go to islands in Uganda where the name of Christ had never been preached. So full of darkness, so full of manifestations of evil you cannot even believe. And I have the, the privilege of witnessing the power of the gospel as it comes into the, the life of a person. It's dramatic. It's not something someone says, I want to learn how to live with it and slowly and walk into it. It's dramatic. Some, the eyes open. The realization of doom comes and says, I am doomed. I need the Lord. And when that comes, there's that openness to turn to the Lord with open arms and say, Lord, have mercy upon me. And when that happens, people around look and say, yes, something beyond human power has happened. And I've seen this again and again and again in different lands where the gospel comes in and this old darkness and people suddenly see the light. 
the change comes in. And I, one of my greatest questions nowadays is, Lord, everyone agrees that the Western world, especially Europe, has become a mission field. But it's a very complicated mission field. It's not the same kind of field you find in Africa or in Asia or in South America. It's a very complicated, it's a, it's a mission field very conversant with the basics of the gospel. And which has formed defenses and arguments and reasonings against the gospel. Such that people who even are very sincere and good hearted are just covered with that veil. And that brings us to the question, what can the church do in such a situation? How much must the church be willing to do in such a situation? Of course, the, the most automatic thing that everybody talks about is prayer. And yes, prayer is the key. There's nothing that can happen. Prayer is like a partnership where we come and say, Lord, we are not able, but we are trusting in you. You are the one to do it, and you are you, you desire to use men, and here we are. So prayer brings us into partnership with the Father, where we cry out to him, let your kingdom come, and let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And I have in my spirit a situation like what was in Jerusalem so many years ago in the days of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was in exile, and his brethren came from Jerusalem to see him. And they say to him, and he asked them, how, what is the state of the people in Jerusalem? How are they? And they, they say to him, the walls of Jerusalem have been broken. And the gates of Jerusalem have been burnt down. And the people are in disgrace. And when he heard those words, if you could go with me to the book of Nehemiah, please. Verse 3 says, they say to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. And Nehemiah says, when I heard this, these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, and he continues to give the prayer. One interesting thing Nehemiah says, when I heard these things, I sat down. That strikes me like pausing activity. I stopped my busy schedules. I put down my programs and schedules. I sat down and wept. And then for some days, I mourned. One day I was asking myself, what does this really represent? And I am a man who knows in the last few years I've lost a number of very loved ones whom the Lord has chosen to take away. And I know what it means when you lose someone and people come around you to comfort you and come around you to speak strength and the word to you and you feel their company. But after a few days or weeks, everybody is gone. And you are there alone. And you cannot go on crying and crying and crying. And you step out and begin to smile and begin to pick up your life and with time people begin to think you're over it but deep inside you know and there are times when you are quiet and you begin to think and you think of that person you lost and you think of what the, of what that person meant what he said what he did or this and that and you go through that and deep inside you are mourning in the night when everybody is asleep and everybody is thinking about the comfort of their beds, you are called up in the bed, going through memories and memories and memories, and missing and feeling how deprived you've become. And I thought, how does that re relate with what Nehemiah was doing? It was almost like, oh my God, what was it like when Jerusalem was still in its glory? What was it like when the wall of Jerusalem was there, the gates were there, and the people were under the presence of the Lord, and the glory of God was with us? Oh, what have we come to? 
imagining what the people are like and the kind of lifestyle they are living in. And maybe we can bring that down to America and say, hey, America, listen and say, what has been taken away from us? What was it like when our foundations were still strong? When our walls were not broken? And the church was still vibrant in this land, and this land was known as a Christian land, which is trying so much today to deny. What was it like when the name of the Lord was invoked by leaders and men in, in the Senate and the Congress knelt down on their knees and prayed together? What was it like when the leaders of cities and states came together and made covenants with the Almighty God and say, Lord, we offer this city to you. We want you, want, we want you to be the king of this city. And if only there are people who would stop and mourn for days, it may come slowly, but if we give it space, it will come through, and you begin to think, what have we come to? Then one of the reasons we lack passion today is we don't stop. We are so fast, and we are busy and doing things and trying to add this to program to the other program. There's not enough time for the hearts to come down and meditate on what it means that America has come to today. But Nehemiah wept, and for many days he mourned, and he fasted. He, lay, he subdued the flesh, that the spirit may even rise higher to the Lord Almighty. And out of that came his prayer. Prayer alone. Many times we look at prayer as the power, but I want you to see the things which empower prayer. The things which build a prayer, the things he did, he said he sat down, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and then out of that he cried, oh my God. The prayer did not just come out of, okay, that's what has happened, let's go and pray about it. The prayer came out of the depth of the heart. It was travailing prayer. We know travail is related to giving birth. It was a prayer that was from deep inside, it was travailing prayer. And it, he interceded, he repented, he confessed the sin. And eventually he saw in his spirit a vision of what needs to be, to be done. He said, I need to go to Jerusalem. I cannot stay here and just say, Lord, 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 do something. I need to go, but how do I go? I'm a slave here. I'm under another man's power. Oh, Lord, give me grace before this man. It was not, no longer about help them, Lord, help them. Now it was about help me to go do something. Give me grace, oh Lord, that I may be released with this man and equipped to go and do the needful. And I think all prayer should reach the place where we are not only mourning and grieving over things, but we come to see the direction the Lord is pointing and say, Lord, I want to be part of that. Give me the favor. I don't even see how I'm going to break out of my situation to, be, to work with you, but give me the grace, almighty God. And he went down to Jerusalem. And the first thing he did, he spied the broken walls. He spied through the city in the night and saw how the wall was broken and how the gates were burnt so that he could count the cost of rebuilding the wall. He was not put off by, the, by how big the work was. Then he mobilized the people and he spoke to them saying, look what a reproach we have become. Look how the name of the Lord has been profaned amongst us. We need to rise up and put our hands to the work and begin to rebuild the wall. Beloved, I am one of the people that really believe in the power of prayer. But over the last few months especially, since the beginning of this year, and when I came and visited America, I was in Orlando and a few other places, the Lord impressed upon my heart so strongly, so strongly, that it doesn't matter how long America prays, it's not going to bring revival to America until the church, the remnant in the church of Jesus Christ are willing to go back and say, Lord, what are the broken walls of America? You know why? Because there are so many things we can, that can affect our mindset and affect the way we see things and therefore we are conformed to the mindset of the land and then from that mindset we come to the Lord and ask him things within our understanding and within our own estimation 
And we are genuine. We are sincere, but wrongly sincere. And our foundation is not the real truth that God would say, this is my will and my heart for the land. And that's why we differ from what the, the Apostle John says. He says, this is the confidence we have. That if we ask anything according to the will of God, we know he hears us. And if he hears us, we have what we have asked. One of the questions we are debating again and again and again down in Uganda is, why is there so much prayer today and so little to show for it? How can we reconcile the picture of a loving God we know, a faithful God we know, a God who is zealous to give more than to receive from us? How can we reconcile that picture with a picture of a church that is offering God prayer, offering prayer for five years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years? And God is not responding. Do you, are you comfortable with that picture? Are you comfortable with the picture of a God who would take the prayers of his people for 30 years without giving what he can give and all along families are being torn apart, children are being destroyed, the society is falling apart and evil is taking over. And this God is just sitting up and saying, pray some more. Something is wrong and we need to step back and say, okay, Lord, show us what it is. A city with a wall is a wall, is a city protected. No, nothing can come in as it wants because the walls, even enemy forces would come and lay siege and still not be able to break through. Sometimes they would break siege and go away because the wall would protect the city. So where there is a broken wall, there's no defense. Anything comes in. Anything is taken out. And if you look at that and put it in the, in the case of the church, I think a church or it's a land, a nation whose walls have been broken down cannot stop what comes from outside. Anything goes. Anything comes in. It will come in like a flood. And the righteous will not want it, will not like it, but they cannot hold it back. They will stand and speak against it, but it, they will be overcome because there's no defense. And even the precious things of the city will be taken out. They will be plundered. There will be no defense to stop it. They will go. And that is what is happening in the land. The inheritance is being eroded, taken away, and evil is being forced upon the land. Even those who do not want it are being squeezed into the corner as evil is claiming more and more territory in the land. When the gates of a city are in place, the wise men have got a place to sit. That's where people would come for counsel. That's where people would come to hear the wisdom of the, of the old men and the judgment of the judges. That's where prophets would go to speak prophetically to the city. So when the gates of the city are burnt, what does that mean? That the land has got no more credible prophetic voices. No more acceptable voices. Because when the gates were there, everybody knew the place of authority. Not any prophet could come and stand up there except they recognized prophets. Or those that clearly had the hand of the Lord. But now that there is no clear platform, anybody prophesies anywhere and people say, why should I believe him? Or why should I believe her? So there's no prophetic authority. And then there is no wisdom from above. It's just like in the days of Eli, the high priest. The word of God was cursed and there was no vision in the land. And what is the wall anyway? Again and again we see in the scriptures where the Lord says, this is what you should do. I am the Lord. It's a way of saying, I am the one who made you. I am the one who made the things you're dealing with. I am the one who knows how they should work. So if you just do that, it will be fine with you. But if you don't do that, then these are the consequences. So the word of God is what forms the wall around us. It's a wall of protection. It's the kind of wall Job had. Lot had, is it Job who had over his life, his household, and he, all, of, all things he had. The enemy could not touch him. Now, if you look in our lives today and you go back to that scripture, I'm looking for a man among them who would build up the wall. 
and stand before me on behalf of the land. Now many times we rush to stand before the Lord, but you don't think about rebuilding the wall. And, but God is saying, I'm looking for a man who would build up the wall and stand before me on behalf of the land that I may not destroy it. But I found none. Praying people, there are many. Those are many. But people who are willing to go back and say, what is the foundation? What are the precepts of the Lord? And if you go back and read Ezekiel 22, from the beginning to the end, God is not talking about any physical wall. God is talking about the institutions of the land of Israel. It talks about governance, about the princes who rule the land. He talks about the officials who work in the land. He talks about the blood guilt of the land, the idolatry of the land, the immorality in the families. He talks about how the sexual relations have been all distorted. Then he talks about the raising of children, how children are being raised up with a mind to be disrespectful to their parents and show disregard for the authority of their parents. And he, he, he says, look at this. Then he goes into the business world and says, look at your balances. You look at the taxes you have and the way you, gain, you make profit and gain excessive interest and extortion. And how you are cheating on one another and you're being so greed and unfair. You've forgotten that I am the Lord. He comes down and says, look at your land. Your land is defiled. Your land is uncleansed. Why? Because of what is happening. Because of everyone is tearing the other. And then he goes down and says, look at my priests. Look in my house. My priests have become wolves. And they have taught my people that there is no difference between the holy and the unholy. The clean and the unclean. They have led my people into error. And then look at the prophets. They prophesy whitewashing all the dirty deeds that, are, that everybody is doing. They prophesy over them and say, you are blessed. God is so pleased with you. And then he says, look at my people. They want things to be the same. They participate in this. You know, this is, and, and the Lord says, look at the people. And after say, talking about all those institutions in the land, he says, and I looked for a man among them. I looked for a man among them who is willing, who would build up the wall and stand before me on behalf of the land. And if we take that into America today, and we look at the institutions of the nation. Remember, God says, all nations are his handwork. Out of one man, he made all the nations of the world that they should inhabit the earth. He determined the exact places where people shall live and the times appointed for them. So if he has planted you in America, it's by his design. And it's not for nothing. It's for a divine purpose. And it's for, this, it's for this time. It does not only determine where people shall live. He determines the times appointed for them. And these are the times. And beloved, if you look at the institutions of the land, the things which, the pillars that make a nation, government, the economy. You remember God says, I'm the Lord. Remember the Lord who gives you power to make wealth that you may confirm his covenant in the land. He's interested in the economy and how it runs. He's interested in families and how they run, in sexual relations. He's not only interested in people being married, man and wife. He's interested in how else we use our sexuality. He talks of a man sleeping with his relative, man with man, man with beast, man with his daughter. And he says, that is a curse upon the land. I am the Lord. He doesn't have to explain. He says, I have said it. I am the Lord. Remember, I created all of you. I know the purpose for each thing. And if you start distorting it all, you are defiling the land. And we've got to believe one thing. If our walls have been broken, very quickly I'll say, what are the consequences of broken walls? What are the consequences of broken walls in government, the broken walls in the economy, in the economic circles, broken walls in our families, broken walls in the institutions which are helping us to raise our children, the education, the media, the culture, and everything? What are the consequences? And then the church, 
with the priests and the way they do their work, with the prophets and the way they do their work, with the officials that, are come, that come in the church and have their deeds whitewashed by the prophets, and the people that have learned to fit in with this system. One thing is prayer. Prayer in such a situation is rendered powerless. It's rendered powerless. Because if God were to answer prayer in, with the people who don't even feel the guilt of what they are doing because they have had decades and decades of being told that is okay, that is right. And today, daily, there's teaching and preaching, enhancing and strengthening the lie. And from that mindset, people come before God and say, Lord, pour out. And these people may be sincere, but they are praying from an, a, a position that is so different from what God would have. Not only in spiritual relationships, but also in human relations, in material relations, relationship with their material property, and everything else. And God says, if I were to pour out my spirit in answer to prayer, I would be confirming your error. I would be saying, okay, I accept the situation. I would lose you because then you would never have a broken heart before me. That's why he holds back. That's why he holds back. He's more eager to give than we are to receive. But if you were to give us in this situation, you know about revivals which came in and all the dirty things which went with the revivals. Brethren, we are living in last days. We cannot afford to have another muddled time of revival. It's time God wants to clean up his church. And he wants to pour out the refiner's fire. It's not about just another good time where all the world will, will flock to one city and say we want to see the power. It's not about that. It's about a child that is going to rise above the system of the world and break the gates that are holding people captive and bring in the lost and the captive without any hindrance because greater is he who is within us than he who is in the world. And this is what we are crying. This is the, this, the, these are the bath pangs all over the world. There is this deep cry. That's why you see today there is such prayer like has never been in all the 2,000 years the church has been. The people are no longer satisfied with what is. Everyone is feeling hungry for more. Everyone wants to see more. No one is satisfied anymore with what we have. We want to see the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to see the glory of God. We want to see the purity. Everywhere in the world, people are saying, is this all Jesus died for? I personally thank God for this man, Mel Gibson, and his film. It really brought it back to us and says, look at this. It's just a, a, an attempt to represent what he went through. But even looking at that, is this all he died for? Is this all he went through that for? Are we the church he wanted? What? Couldn't we have been the way we are without him dying? Oh, sure. Think about it. Just with a few laws and regulations, we could do what we are doing today. There's more. There's more. And it's time for people to say, Lord, I cannot continue with life as usual. I need to stop in my tracks and say, Lord, show me what to do. Show me the broken walls in my personal life in regard to you. Show me the broken walls in my relationship and marriage. Show me the broken walls in the way I'm raising up my children. Show me the broken walls in the way I worship you and regard the church and ministry. And regard the brethren and the relationship we have. That, are we fulfilling the love relationship that God called us unto? Or have we settled for some kind of club where everybody is allowed to do whatever he wants and not relate with God according to their demand? There's only one law he gave us. He, he, he did away with all the laws and gave us one law. Love. And that's the one we don't even care to examine. How many of us are really living trying to check that covenant love where he says, as my father loved you, loved me, so have I loved you. Go and love each other as I have loved you. 
If we were really hungry, we'd say, Lord, have mercy upon me. Kill that which is in me and hold me back from loving like you want me to love. Because love fulfills the law. Love fulfills everything God wants. And that's one thing that is really lacking in the body of Christ. And I'm not talking of human love. This is not something we can manufacture. We need to go down before God and say, teach me. Teach me how to lay down my life that I may love that you may love through me. And then all the things we're doing in the place of work, in business, in, in, in our relationships with our nation and the way we regard the nation God has given us, the way we speak about the nation God has given us, there are broken walls left and right. Broken walls, broken walls. If God were to pour out his spirit here, it would ooze out of our cities with no time. And I'll finish with this. If we are going to mend and build our broken walls, there are a few implications. One, we need to recognize that if there are broken walls, there are definitely forces which came in and invited. And these forces and influences changed the mindset of our people. And when we talk about changing the mindset of our people, before we talk about our people, we need to think about ourselves. Lord, how has my mindset been molded by my world around me rather than by your word? And this is where a true revival starts, really. I remember one of my heroes is Charles Finney. Anywhere he went in any city, he did not only lock himself up and pray, he walked through the streets and listened to the conversations of the people. He listened and by that he was spying the brokenness in their lives. The brokenness in their families, in their businesses, in their, in their relationships. And he went back before God and cried. And it's time for us to start examining that and say, Lord, show me the brokenness. But also show me the corrupt wisdom. Very quickly, I will say Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 28. It's 128 says, When they refused to be with God in their knowledge, he gave them over the corrupt mind to do things which are not convenient. And makes a long list. And it ends by saying, They know that those who do such things deserve to die. But they not only do them, they encourage each other in doing them. That's exactly what is going on today. And it's so easy to be a Christian and not to realize that you are also encouraging in one way or another the wrong concepts to go on in the land or in the family. We just were in Canada, Toronto with Sheila. And these wonderful families, very loving parents and zealous and crying before God when you look at the lifestyle of the children that stay with them in their homes. The way they live and the way they are, their the way their morality, and yet they say, well, "That's the way the children are. That's the way things are." Well, do you realize there's a broken wall, and every broken, whenever you have a broken wall, it's going to keep bringing in influences. Influences will will not only change the mindset; they will defile. They will defile the land. So if we're going to really mend our walls, we must be willing to deal with the cleansing of the land. Not only repenting and confessing sin, but dealing with anything that defiles the land and take it out of our midst. Cleanse up the land. Cleansing up our personal lives, our homes, our churches, our businesses, and our relationships. Another thing we need to realize is the enemy does not only come in and defiles and changes the mindset. When, when a, if the enemy succeeds in changing the mindset, he has a foothold to take into bondage. Forget these teachings about, oh no, a Christian cannot come under any bondage. Well, watch the fruits. Watch the fruits. They will show you who is at work. The spirit of God or the spirit of the world. Therefore, we must come to terms with the issue of resisting the enemy. The Bible says, humble yourselves before God, submit unto the Lord, and resist the enemy. Now, I understand that there's a concept of spiritual warfare that has been handed out down through the ages. 
which is not as if it's not effective and many people have chosen not even to think about that but the time has come to recognize that we are dealing with spiritual realities and these realities, these forces are real. They are operating. This is why today you have a team that is working together with you. And they are full of zeal. And the next day one of them comes up with a totally wrong spirit. And because most people in the church here in America have chosen to flee from spiritual confrontation. The next thing you do is to judge the brother or the sister. If possible, push him out of the fellowship because he's really exhibiting a wrong spirit. But a wrong spirit is not the person. The person is a child of God, loved of God, and God wants them free. So if we don't know how to deal with the spirit, we are going to judge the person. We need to be equipped to wage warfare and break the yoke. And tonight I just want to say, I said a lot of things. I hope the Lord will take out that, something and bring it to me. To mean something in our hearts. And the most important thing is to say, Lord, give me a heart that connects with you. Give me a heart that is able to process what you're showing me. It's not enough to say, Lord, show me the way. And then after showing you the way, you say, oh, thank you, Lord, that was good. You need to decide whether you, want, you are going to take the way. Or you're going to stand back and say, Somebody else show me the way. I wasn't very sure when he showed me. Next year I'm going to come back and say, will you do it again? Just make sure I... S and that's what we are doing every year. Like, show me the way and we don't walk the way. May God have mass upon us. Why don't you rise up and talk to God? I would like to ask that we pray in three phases one should be personal just you coming before god and just say lord have mercy upon me open my eyes to see what you see and to feel what you feel and really help me not just to be an observer but to walk with you and then the second thing should be i would like us to pray together we'll turn around and make little, little circles of three, four people just hold hands and just pray for each other that these, these days we have here this week, God will come through every time, every period of ministry and the word, the teaching, the fellowships that you're going to have here, that God will somehow minister to us in a way. Pray for each other not to miss what God is doing. Pray for each other not to miss what God is saying. Pray for each other to have the, the heart, a soft heart before God, willing and ready to move with God. And then the third way of prayer I would ask, let us, we lift up America. We lift up America before God and cry for the remnant out there. There are men and women out there who still have a hunger for the righteousness of God, for the glory of God. And let us just pray, God, please reach out even this week. Reach out to these men all over America from north to south, east to west. Raise up the remnant. Raise up the remnant and strengthen the remnant to be strong and claim back this nation for your purposes. Hallelujah. Will you just raise your hands to the Father and just come individually before the God, the Lord. I hope you can raise your voice and just talk to God without being self-conscious as the music plays in the background. Just talk to the Lord. Just talk to Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Personally bring your life before God. Pray for eyes to see the broken walls. Eyes to see the broken walls in every area of life. In prayer, in the word, in the walk of obedience. Until next time. Farewell, and God bless.